Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have another super strong guest for you this week. He's been a top 10 player in the world. He's currently, I believe, number 24. He's got all kinds of records. He was India's youngest IM in 2000, youngest GM in 2001. Now those records are being broken by all these young champions, which we'll discuss. Uh, He's won many titles, the World Junior Champion, the Asian Individual Champion. The list goes on. He's now sort of a chess author as he's published a course on Chessable called French Toast, How Harry Krishna Fries Won E6. And that gives away his identity, uh, which is Grandmaster Hari Krishna. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be on this show. Well, it's an honor to have you. Uh, you're coming off of, of course, we want to talk about your chessable course and your career generally, but you've you've had a couple pretty, I mean, from my perspective, good showings. I guess you could also call them near misses. But as you sit back and reflect on your two recent tournaments, the Shenzhen Masters in April in China, and then the, the Sigmund tournament in Malmo, Sweden in May, uh, how do you assess how it went for you, Hari? Um, so, yeah, before going to Shenzhen, I made a uh, chessable course and uh, I went to play in Shenzhen. Uh, I started off uh, not so great. Uh, a draw against uh, Yakovenko was fine, but uh, a loss against Tanish in round two. And uh, from that moment, I don't know what happened, but uh, I just started to win uh, game after game. And uh, I mean, even I was quite surprised that I won so many games uh, in a t- super tournament like Shenzhen. And, uh, of course, I uh, I would have loved to uh, win this uh, event, uh, especially I was leading... Uh, I was leading until the last round and uh, a loss against Ding Liren um, uh, uh, was uh, very unfortunate. Um, however, it was a very nice uh, comeback for me. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, uh, considering the fact that uh, I was not really uh, doing so well before the event and uh, also I started off quite badly. Um, I, I was, uh, I was, uh, I mean, it was kind of a comeback uh, uh, tournament for me, uh, and uh, to, I just felt uh, very nice playing uh, these games uh, in Shenzhen. And um, even though uh, I missed uh, title by, you know, half a point, uh, I was not uh, so disappointed as uh, one should be. So I guess I just enjoyed uh, my games uh, playing in uh, Shenzhen, and uh, I had uh, wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful games there. So I was, uh, I mean, many results. Uh, I I lost some. I I won some. So uh, it was great tournament for me. Um, of course, we can always discuss about uh, the, uh, you know, the, the half a point or one point where I could, uh, where I missed against Anish Giri. In fact, this was probably the crucial moment where uh, uh, things would have been much clearer. Uh, I should have uh, won against Anish and uh, then I guess uh, it would have been uh, pretty easy to win the event. And uh, after that, I had like uh, one week uh, gap, so I could, uh, you know, uh, prepare a little bit for Sigaman, although not so much. <clears throat> and uh, Sigaman tournament is uh, uh, was a, a very interesting field. Uh, I was the top seed there, um, and uh, many fighting chess players, and uh, also uh, Nihal Sarin was there, uh, who is. Uh, improving uh, very well and uh, he crossed 2600 recently and um, I had uh, I, I, I won two games uh, there but uh, the 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 game uh, win against Nihal I mean the final move which I made was uh, quite uh, memorable for me and uh, I finished second I had to win against uh, Gawain Jones in uh, in the last round but uh, okay with black pieces, I was uh, I, I actually had a bad position, or maybe not bad, but uh, slightly worse position. And uh, um, 
well basically i was satisfied with the draw uh, from uh, position per perspective and uh, um, second was a decent uh, result and uh, i was uh, uh, i was quite happy with my game in sigaman and uh, yeah so that's about uh, both the events uh, shenzhen and uh, uh, sigaman yeah, good showing for sure. And just to echo what you said, I definitely recommend listeners check out the the game with Nihal Sar, and I'll, I'll link to it. Uh, it looks like he gave you a pretty good game. I mean, you kind of pulled a rabbit out of your hat at the end with that that cool ending that you alluded to. Um, yeah, actually, he gave. Uh, um, he was probably better prepared than uh, I was uh, uh, in the opening, and also, um, I I think he he fought very well uh, in the middle game. It's just that uh, I got this uh, nice trick in the end game. Uh, thanks to this, I won this game. Uh, but he's uh, improving. Uh, uh, rapidly and um, I I think he has uh, I mean he's a, a big fighter he it's uh, he's a tough defender so yeah I, I think uh, he will go very high yeah it sure seems like it and so from your own perspective thinking back on the tournament having gotten two seconds which I'm sure is a little bit bittersweet because it's yeah. a strong showing as you say but but you're also yeah. so close uh, and yeah. especially Shenzhen I know yeah. uh, Magnus uh, and Anish Giri were going back and forth about whether it's a super tournament but uh, pretty strong tournament for sure and so how do you well, how do you attribute the success that you had like was there anything you were doing different building up to the tournament Hari? Um, one interesting uh, thing about, uh, I noticed in Shenzhen was uh, all the games, uh, uh, who uh, all the players who were defending uh, and slightly worse end games or uh, uh, various positions uh, somehow lost. I mean, it's like uh, it's incredible. Even myself, uh, the games which I lost were like uh, uh, probably a bit worse or something, and uh, somehow. I don't know, somehow the defending side was collapsing uh, quite a lot. Um, yeah, I, I, I know the Twitter uh, <laughs> conversations between uh, Magnus and uh, Anish. I mean, uh, I think it's uh, it should be taken in a funny way and uh, there is nothing. Uh, uh, I, I don't think uh, both of them mean anything. So it's just for the public, I think. Um, yeah, of course, Magnus knows it's uh, Shenzhen is a super tournament, and uh, I, I think none of the players or organizers really, you know, uh, it was uh, in a uh, it was in a funny way. So um, yeah, and uh, um, uh, like like I said, it, this was really surprising, uh, but this is how it went in Shenzhen. Um, I mean, uh, many games which I won also. It, uh, it, they were not really like I had huge advantage and I converted them, but it was uh, uh, pretty much dry end games. Uh, slowly could uh, win these games. So yeah, I don't know the reason to be honest. It's it seems like you have a special knack. <clears throat> Excuse me, losing my voice a bit. <clears throat> Sorry. It seems like you have a special knack for pulling out end games. Do you think that's something that that has come naturally to you, or is it something you've worked on, or both? <laughs> Actually, I I I don't I I don't think uh, I I won uh, in such a way in recent times. Uh, it, for me, uh, my friends also asked like, uh, how did you play these end games? Because uh, I am not. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm not bad in end games, but uh, I'm not uh, so good in end games that I could win such a position. So. Uh, I was really ha happy that I could do, but uh, I myself do not know how I did it. And uh, I mean, I, 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 my victories are most like mostly like some kind of uh, uh, complicated stuff or uh, various unclear battles. But uh, um, I used to play like this a uh, couple of years ago, but not in recent times. So I guess maybe I, uh, I, I played a bit more solid, uh, let's say after uh, my loss against Anish and uh, not like passive way but uh, in a way to keep uh, the pressure and uh, try to get some chances. So yeah, that helped uh, I guess in uh, uh, in winning some games there. 
Okay. And when you have a tournament coming up, uh, an invitational like this, where you know you're going to be who you're going to be playing, is all of your work on openings, or do you do like calculation exercises as well? Or as you ramp up for a tournament of of this stature, what's your preparation like? Um, usually, it's uh, opening preparation. It's hard to prepare uh, uh, against specific opponents. Okay, for Shenzhen, it is possible, but let's say if you are playing. Uh, uh, just one round where you don't know the colors uh, which you are going to play. There I just uh, analyze my openings but also uh, do some calculation uh, part with various studies or study some end games and uh, um, different kinds of uh, chess related stuff. Um, it, it really depends on uh, which mood I, I would be before the event like sometimes I don't want to see openings because um, maybe I just want to feel fresh Um, so it really uh, it really depends uh, at which uh, phase like uh, if let's say three two or two to three days before the event I generally don't uh, uh, don't use engine or openings that much okay so you kind of ramp up and then sort of uh cruise in a little bit so you're not yeah. exhausted going into the tournament yeah yeah exactly yeah. yeah that makes sense and hari what's you do you have your next tournament planned at this point uh yes i'm going to play in uh, grand prix series which is going to be in uh, uh, riga okay. and uh yeah it's the second second one of the gp series the first one was held in moscow but uh, i'll be playing in the uh, re, uh, in the Riga one and Hamburg and uh, Tel Aviv. Okay, and you've uh, you are you now based in Prague? Yes, I am. Ba- I am in Prague. And yes. and I know that uh, previously you were in Belgrade. Is that right? Yes, yes, I was in so, Belgrade. So what uh, what caused you to decide to move? Um, well, uh, to start with, I um, I was in Belgrade because of uh, my wife. And uh, then we moved to Prague because uh, it gives uh, easy access to play in uh, various events in uh, in uh, European Union, and also my uh, I play for Czech team here. It's called Novibor. Uh, I already played um, um, well five seasons uh, so far, and uh, and also I time to time work with David Navara. So that's there are many reasons, but uh, you can say these are the main reasons. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Prague. How do how do you like it as a city? Yeah, it's great. It's a, a wonderful city. It's great. Uh, I, I have uh, I work I visited Prague uh, even before I came here uh, while working with David Navara back in 2012 and so on. Uh, but of course, it's a uh, it's different uh, situation when you are staying there. Yeah, and I imagine how how do you do you miss India and do you get back there often? Um, yeah, uh, of course I miss India. Um, uh, I'm from Hyderabad, uh, so I go uh, I go often to visit uh, my family there, and uh, also I I have a, uh, I have an event to uh, play in India, which is uh, played by all the top players in uh, India. Uh, and uh, I also play uh, um, like last year I played also Kolkata Rapid Tournament and so on so yeah I uh, I go a um, couple of times in a year yeah and I know you've you've talked in prior interviews about how for example uh, Vishy Anand moved to Europe and that probably helped his chess so is is your decision to live in Europe is that just strictly professional or do you enjoy it on a personal level too I think uh, it's both uh, because uh, unless you enjoy uh, yourself uh, personal level, you cannot really uh, uh, put into work. Like uh, in my case, it's chess. So uh, it's uh, in a way it is uh, for my uh, betterment of chess and my career. Uh, but I do enjoy the interactions with uh, people and um, I got many friends uh, around uh, uh, in my club and uh, other uh, friends too. Okay. Yeah, and I've had um 
we've been lucky enough to interview some other uh, notable Indian chess players, um, such as uh, Sagar Shah, who I know you've done interviews with, and I'm sure you're friendly with, and Vidit. And I always find it interesting hearing about uh, the system of support for chess in India, uh, where professionals are often compensated by sort of, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm misphrasing this, but sort of uh, government-sponsored corporations. Um, when when you live in India, I mean, sorry, when you live in Europe, are are you is an opportunity like that still available to you? Yes, uh, I, in fact, I represent uh, a company called Bharat Petroleum Corporation Limited. Uh, like most of the most of the players uh, from uh, top players from India are employed uh, in one of the companies, oil companies especially. Uh, in this regard, uh, the oil companies, I mean, public sector uh, oil companies are doing great job by supporting uh, uh, many sports. And uh, since uh, it's uh, like uh, they are supporting chess in a big way. And uh, uh, I think this, this, is, this is the tournament I was talking about that we all of us uh, uh, play, play an event where... Uh, 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 we play as a team and uh, each team like uh, each oil company has like several players and then uh, it will be decided who will be the champion and so on and uh, i also wear a logo while uh, playing tournaments and uh, um, yeah so i i, I wherever i can uh, uh, showcase that uh, they i am i am working with bharat petroleum i usually do Okay, it's great that you that you have the flexibility to to live where you can pursue your chess um, to the highest degree while still having um, some sort of sponsorship. Yeah, yeah, it's a great uh, great support uh, from uh, them to uh, to you know to. Uh, I mean, I joined uh, in two thousand ten, um, and they have been supporting me, uh, you know, to improve my career. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a it's a good system. I hope that some other countries can adopt it over time. But oh, Harry, right. sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it's a very good system, uh, and uh, not only this. I would like to add that uh, they also give uh, in the name of scholarships to various uh, juniors and youngsters uh, who can participate in uh, various events in uh, Europe or some other countries. Yeah, and that's why uh, young Indian chess players are taking over the world. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Do you have, um, out of all the young chess players, uh, the the young phenoms coming from India, is is there one that you would uh, favor as a potential future world champion, or is it too hard to pick? Um, I I think I I wouldn't want to put uh, uh, pressure on any one particular kid because uh, I know how uh it is uh, it, it's a huge pressure when uh, when they get to hear that they are the ones who should go and so on uh, but from india i can tell you that uh, there are at least 5 to 6 kids um, um like uh, gukesh who who became uh, gm recently yes and uh, pregnananda is there nihal sarin is there and uh, there are uh, Three more, uh, three more players, um, wh- whose names I am not remembering right now, but uh, uh, they are approximately uh, in the range of twenty five hundred or maybe twenty four seventy eighty. Uh, so we have like uh, ar- around six players. I think uh, has very good potential, and uh, of course they need to work uh, on their chess and. Uh, uh, improve uh, slowly and um, uh, only time will tell like who will be uh, able to break it into the next level like i'm talking about the absolute top yeah that makes sense and of course you have unique perspective on uh n- being aware of the potential pressure that being sort of anointed like that could could put on someone because you uh, yourself were were considered a prodigy by some. I mean, you won world world titles uh, at various ages. So, where, how aware were you of like the other people talking about you as you collected these titles through your early and teenage years? Actually, when I won the world under ten in Menorca back in ninety six, I was not even aware of uh, the importance of world titles. So. 
I think uh, I was not really under pressure or something uh, back then. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, when I won uh, some other events like uh, uh, World Junior in 2004, uh, then the Commonwealth uh, Championship in 2001 and Asian Championship in 2011. Um, uh, by this time, of course, I many people expected uh, me to win and also... Uh, I was doing quite quite well, um, but uh, of course I got used to. Uh, uh, I mean, 2011 is already. Uh, I was uh, experienced player, uh, but initially I had a couple of uh, you know setbacks, um, and but however it's very important for the kid or uh, you know it can be adult to realize like. Um, if they are enjoying what they are uh, doing, like studying chess or analyzing chess or playing chess or anything with chess, like if they are enjoying or they are just doing it uh, automatic. So I think that's uh, that's something which I would advise for uh, kids especially. Uh, but for me, this, this is uh, one thing I always uh, uh, analyze myself even when I was doing well or when I was in, uh, uh, you know, uh, in playing uh, not so well so i always uh, analyze after the event okay so am i in a good good spirit or not so that is quite important for me yeah you had a great quote and uh, i came across an old print interview with sagar shah where you said when you when you won the world under 10 you just went up to your room and watched cartoons because you didn't you didn't know it was a big deal at all yeah, actually, at that, that time it was true. I didn't really know the, how big it was. Uh, um, yeah, for because for us, uh, I mean, for me, I, uh, it was just normal that every day I finish my game and watch Cartoon Network. So <laughs> I was doing the same thing even after I won. So, yeah. And when you were when you were collecting all these titles and getting stronger and stronger, uh, and you know, people are starting to talk about you. How how much of this do you think? Uh, can be attributed to to sort to hard work versus how much of it do you think you just had sort of a a natural ability to to improve at chess? I think uh, uh, natural ability can take a player to certain level, but uh, after that it uh, it really uh, it really matters how uh, how much you work. And not only how much, but uh, the way you work and uh, are you enjoying this work. So uh, all together uh, makes you improve your chess, I think. Uh, this is how it. Uh, this is how I feel uh, with my career. And uh, I, I, I could, I mean, I reached uh, pretty much uh, like 2200 back in those days, so... Uh, nowadays, twenty two hundred is not maybe not such a big deal, but uh, those uh, ninety six, seven, eight, uh, it, I was maybe like twenty two or twenty one eighty, and uh, I was working uh, quite a lot uh, before I became international master, and uh, I I wouldn't say that uh, I I mean I won't say that uh, talent can just take you. Uh, anywhere and uh, I think uh, every top player has uh, worked hard to uh, reach where they are right now. So was there a moment for you where like a, a light bulb went on, went on where you realized that you needed to take chess more seriously or did you kind of have that in you all along? Well I don't like really uh, to lose <laughs> like uh -huh. every <laughs> so uh, when I realized that I am not the best in, uh, I mean, I mean, like there was a moment after I won under ten, I felt like I am really good, and then I had uh, a tournament in Kolkata in ninety-ninety-seven, I think, uh, maybe ninety-six or ninety-seven February. So everyone uh, 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 won against me and I was playing almost in the last board. So that was, you can say that uh, that was one of the moments when I felt, okay, I still have a long way. Okay. Huh. And, and you've, you've made good progress and do you, obviously, um, and do you at this point, do you still think in terms of goals or do you just kind of just trust the process of trying to get better at chess? Um, 
I I definitely have goals, um, but uh, the thing is, I need to. Um, well, uh, I had a couple of bad results in the last uh, couple of months, and uh, I didn't play so well in, especially last year. I, in my opinion, and uh, I need to get back to my you know normal level and then uh, to start thinking about uh, bigger uh, goals right first equalize and then start to push well first uh, need to feel good about your chest that's that's how i would like to put it like i'm uh, playing at a good level and a level where i feel this is uh, how i can play chess you know so uh, when i i'm missing things or when i am not able to uh, um give uh, my best then i think that is the main work uh, that is the area where i need to work yeah that makes sense um well hopefully these recent tournaments are a good push yes. Yes. um and and i saw that uh in in shenzhen you managed to trot out uh one of the lines you recommend in french toast against richard rapport so that's uh that that provides us a nice segue into your your chessable course french toast um so why don't you, um, I mean, of course, I want to talk about the course itself and about the lines you recommend. But uh, first, I'm curious just uh, how how the project came to be. So did someone from Chessable reach out to you? I know that I had uh, David Cramley, the the um, co-founder of Chessable, on, and he was mentioning that they were looking for elite players to make courses. So did did someone approach you and you had an interest or how did it how did it come about? Well, actually, yeah, uh, it's it started uh, that uh, Magesh uh, contacted me that someone uh, wants to speak to me, like uh, um, Dimitri. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah. yes, yes, and uh, uh, that's how we got in touch. And then he briefly explained the idea of Chessable and how the course functions, and he showed me uh, various uh, features from Chess uh, on Chessable. And uh, when I expressed my uh, interest, and uh, after uh, seeing the website, then uh, I got uh, we uh, we kind of uh, had a meeting with uh, David and uh, Dimitri and myself, and then uh, uh, that's how things uh, progressed. Uh, of course, it was uh, also quite uh, important to decide on which course because I am really uh, this is my first course, and also. Uh, uh, it's not a uh, typical book, it's a different kind of uh, platform where uh, each person can uh, train uh, train himself all the variations. So uh, there will be a lot of questions and uh, you need to address uh, most of, uh, at least let's say, at least 80% of the doubts. And uh, also I, I was interested to know the um, the, the strength of the players and uh, various other things. And uh, that's how uh, it started. And uh, after that, uh, it's uh, uh, in fact it was uh, actually last year uh, we when I decided to make the course. Okay, um, just to clarify for listeners, that's uh, Grandmaster Magish Panchanathan, who lives a uh, fellow New Jersey resident, and I am Dimitri Schneider, who reached out to him. And uh, your your answer. Uh, Hari segues perfectly into a question from a supporter of the podcast. So um, I am going to read this question from Benjamin Porto, who says, uh, Hello, I do not currently study the French repertoire, but I watched the introduction video and it looks very interesting. It seems that you made a very good effort for making the repertoire simple and accessible to club players. How difficult is it for a world-class player to put himself in the shoes of a much weaker player for making lines recommendations? And, and will there be more chessable books? Many thanks and all the best. Okay, thank you for uh, this question. Uh, in fact, I think uh, um, um, uh, it's. Uh, I think the concept of uh, giving uh, any strength, uh, good co- candidate moves, and uh, 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 sound uh, variation based on uh, logic is uh, quite important, and often the. Uh, Players with higher strength can uh, understand it uh, a bit faster, but if you explain it uh, in a nice, uh, in a in a way, uh, uh, the low, uh, the um, less 
uh, strong players can understand i think it's uh, not a big deal in fact uh, that's what i try to do with uh, french course um, i i think uh, it's uh the course is uh, not just for a particular strength or uh, you know particular uh, way a style of players uh, i think uh, what i try to do with this course is to show that uh, you, even as uh, if anyone can understand super grandmaster or any uh, top players moves as long as uh, the logic behind uh, those moves are explained in a proper way and uh, this can be done only if uh, uh, if you um, if you are able to explain uh, uh, without the computer's logic but to explain uh, from your personal experience yeah and and you um you practiced what you preached when you played it against richard rapport um, yes and uh, i uh, and if there's a video uh, for listeners there's a video uh, there's several videos actually where uh, GM Hari Krishna goes over a few of his games from China with uh, Sagar Shah, including uh, the Richard Rapport game, if if I'm not mistaken. Um, so I'll link to those in the show description. And it was funny that that you – it's no secret, by the way, uh, for anyone wondering which lines you recommend because you do like an introduction video for Chessable where you go through what the various recommendations are. And I bought the course and I enjoyed it and I found it very digestible. And <laughs> – and I found it funny that you introduced the 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 line you suggested uh, against the winner were e4 e6 d4 d5 knight c3 bishop e4 e takes d5. I was always a um, a Tarash player, so my winner were knowledge was quite scant. But that line just went on my radar last year in the Michael Adams uh, Gupta game. Um, yeah. and, and I I had never seen it before, and, I, and I'm always, you know, I'm a typical club player, sort of. I'm always looking for shortcuts. So I was like, oh, yeah. wait, you, you know, you can play that and not have to know all this theory. And then I, I haven't been working on my chess, so I hadn't thought about it until your course. But then, as luck would have it, there it was. Yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, that's the beauty about chess. I, I mean, if you, if you can work, you can also go into uh, variations, uh, uh, like uh, knight c3 bishop b4 e5 uh, which can open like uh, bun- tons of uh, openings i mean it's uh, they are also quite entertaining and quite fun to analyze with and uh, however my um, my idea is to give something which is uh, simple yet uh, um, not like okay it's equal position but uh, you should just play but uh, to get uh, to fight for advantage or at least to uh, get a nice position so that uh, your opponent is uh, defending is on the defending side and uh, i think i managed to do that well in uh, winover in fact uh, when i started to analyze for this uh, winover i was not really sure that if i can manage to get uh, um, advantage or to show something where uh, players can play because normally uh, a3 variation is uh, quite popular in uh, in winover setups where black takes bishop c3 and bc3 but uh, this was not the direction which uh, i recommended and uh, also i i came up with uh, several nice ideas of course um, it's probably some of some of the Material is uh, uh, like help uh, with the computer because uh, some of the tactics or some uh, nice moves. But uh, it, it it was quite interesting for me. I, I, when I was uh, making this course and studying, it really uh, was interesting. I, I thought it was too easy for black, but uh, uh, it wasn't so easy as I thought uh, initially. Yeah, I mean, well, it's it's highly admirable as I've as I've mentioned that you you put your money where your mouth was and played it in a you know elite level game. So it's uh, nice to see. Um, yeah, actually, uh, I played against uh, uh, also uh, in two blitz games against uh, F- Karuana in uh, February. Um, but uh, okay, my result was so dis- such a disaster. <laughs> probably no. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I played also against him in uh, in um, uh, in uh, Saint Louis match, and I think I uh, I forgot what I uh, had actually analyzed because the course was not published; it was still in the beta testing. 
and uh, later on i looked in my notes and uh, i had a better improvement over my play there so yeah it was uh, it was quite and i mean that's that's one of the reasons uh, how i uh, how i felt i can play this hit uh, against anyone so that's how i played against Richie. In fact, I played two times uh, against him the same uh, winner, uh, once in Prague. Okay. And uh, and what about the the part of Ben's question, Benjamin Porto? I don't know if uh, you know yet, but do you think you'll be doing any more courses for Chessable? Oh, yes, I forgot to answer that. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, so far, uh, it went well, in my opinion, for French course. Um, and... Uh, Okay, the, the next, uh, I mean, the second half of the year will be quite busy. Um, I, I had uh, more time, uh, you know, last year and uh, in the first half of uh, 2019. Um, but yeah, certainly when uh, in future I will do uh, courses on Chessable and uh, I hope to, uh, you know, pick a nice topic and uh, I'm, I'm open to, you know, do some... Uh, um, some course related to I don't know middle games or even openings or end games, but it really depends on uh, what they ask from me. Okay, well that's great to hear. We'll we'll look forward to that. But obviously you've got a you know you're you, you've got a mountain one last mountain to climb in your chest. So you got to got to put that first, as you say. Um, yeah. Ex- so. Um, so one thing that we haven't talked about much yet, but we always like to talk about here on the show, Hari, is uh, chess improvement. Um, uh, you know, a, a one interesting topic that came up recently, uh, I interviewed a young American grandmaster, uh, Nicholas Cheka, and uh, Tyron Ross, friend and supporter of the podcast, just chimed in and was sort of asking, like, I think he felt like um, like everyone's trying to get better at chess, but but sometimes it feels like grandmasters have this secret sauce because... We we take their book recommendations, but but we don't improve at the same rate. Um, so I don't know. It's kind of it's always an elusive question in chess. But but to what extent, like when you were learning and when you were a kid, to what extent do you feel like you just were were naturally able to calculate? And to what extent do you feel like um, it was just your love for the game pushed you forward? Um, I think uh, calculation was one of the, my strengths. So, uh, but of course, I it's not like I got it by birth or something. But uh, I always enjoyed calculation. But that's mostly because uh, I I was not good at openings because uh, I had to survive somehow. You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's born out of necessity more than uh, uh, ability, and uh, I. I was uh, solving uh, two five four five dominations. I don't mm. know if uh, yeah, that book gets recommended a lot, Kasparian. Yes, as a kid, I really liked this. I mean, the thing is, uh, this book was uh, done in uh, um, uh, pre-computer era. So whatever the explanation or whatever the positions, they are so much human and. Uh, it's really nice to solve them and okay there might be some mistakes maybe uh, maybe some some small mistakes might be there but it doesn't matter and uh, there was also another book which uh, has uh, some team themes like uh, i don't i don't remember the book name right now but i remember 2545 uh, book this this is uh, i really like this book and do you remember approximately what your rating was when you started tackling that book um i'm not sure if i was rated but probably if i was i should be 2185 okay so yeah it's pretty pretty reasonably high level stuff uh as far as uh for listeners wondering um but definitely i mean it's it's amazing hari how often I've had strong players come on and talk about the importance of solving studies. I mean, it's just uh, something uh, practically every week, and a Kasparian in particular gets mentioned all the time. Now, there are many uh, great uh, composers. Uh, I I think uh, really great composers. I I, I cannot name uh, each one of them, but uh, many many of them are there. And um, I think the reason why studies uh, is important, like uh, you feel good solving a study. And uh, this is uh, one, I mean, I don't know if you will 
get these positions in a real game. You know, some sometimes people ask what is the use of solving studies, and uh, it's not always like you study and you get a point. It uh, chess is not just this. So you also have to enjoy yourself, uh, and uh, these are the moments you make for yourself to study and. Uh, in in this uh, in this process of uh, solving studies you also uh, your brain uh, kind of absorbs some uh, themes uh, which can occur but i would say maybe quite less but but uh, the fact that you are able to solve is a nice feeling and what was your approach in terms of how to solve them would you keep working on them until you had them or would you uh, give it a certain amount of time Ah uh, no, I I would never do that uh, thing. Like to uh, wait until I get the solution because, uh, for example, you, you cannot uh, you cannot think for a move uh, on the board for one hour or right. half hour. So at some point you need to really say, okay, I mean I'm missing the pattern, so let's see what's the solution. Or I mean, you try for some time, but it's not like if you don't get it, you are. Uh, your chess has gone down or something. It's just uh, I I I, th- I solve studies mostly to you know like a warm up. Uh, I would say that uh, it starts your brain and then you know you can work on other things and so on. Okay, and we've got another one more question from a supporter of the podcast. Uh, sure. The famous Moonmaster Nine Thousand, famous mysterious supporter, Patreon supporter of the podcast. So okay. Mr. Moonmaster asks, he says, Hi, Hari Krishna. I've learned a lot from playing through your, your games. Growing up, did you find playing through the games of Masters to be an important part of improving? If so, do you have a specific way of studying Grandmaster games? Have you learned them so deeply that you've memorized them? If so, how many would you estimate you've memorized? I'm not really. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for asking this question. Uh, Moonmaster nine thousand. <laughs> yes, the Gadakamski is a big fan of Moonmaster nine thousand as well. So, <laughs> okay, okay. So thank you. Um, uh, I uh, I have uh, like in the process of studying or growing uh, over the years, I I have come across many. Uh, games of world champions, uh, strong grandmasters and uh, grandmasters, international masters. And it doesn't uh, uh, mean that I only uh, uh, look into strong, only the uh, world champions or top level games, but also any game is, uh, I mean, not like uh, really lower, but... uh, uh, in a normal tournaments, uh, most of the top players follow uh, many of the events, and uh, I think the patterns uh, I do remember some of them, but uh, I cannot really uh, memorize uh, all the games which I have seen. That's uh, it's. I mean, for me, it's not possible. <laughs> and uh, I think when we see certain position, uh, I can recognize uh, this pattern that I have seen it earlier. And uh, also, when I I get some kind of theme over the board, I can recognize, and that helps me to uh, to ease in the uh, way of calculating uh, uh, certain variations. And uh, I have I have uh, seen many of uh, um, world champions uh, games. Um, but to remember all of them is uh, really tough for me. Okay, and you don't make a special effort to remember them as like a study method? No, not really. I, 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 I only want to, I mean, I, I study them in a way that I am able to absorb the, uh, the, the main point from this game. Uh, like, uh, um, like when you see uh, Capablanca's games or when you see Fisher's games, you understand that uh, they are trying to uh, show their argument, m- meaning in a chess, chess uh, terms. And uh, you need to uh, understand what they are trying to prove while playing chess. And uh, that concept is uh, the most important for me. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um Okay. Well, thanks for that answer. Just a couple more questions, if you don't mind, Hari. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Great. Um, so, do you have a favorite game of yours uh, that that you've ever played? 
um uh, well at this point i can remember one of my games against uh, shahriyar mamedyarov from uh, baku olympiad um i was black and uh, i made a nice sacrifice uh, even i mean it it's, it wasn't really my preparation it was just over the board and uh, you can say that one of uh, one of the games which i have seen uh, earlier like uh, uh, world champions games could have been in my mind and i was able to um, you know recreate this uh, exchange sacrifice do you know which game which world champion game it was I don't know. I mean that's that's what I'm saying. I I really cannot uh, remember that way but uh, it just stays in my mind and uh, when I I get to play I can play it. Yeah, I mean well it's more practical to know the pattern than to be able to name the pattern and be able to name yes. where it comes from. Yes. No, it's not just practical but it's difficult even. Yeah. But yeah, I mean it, yeah, I'm always amazed players of your stature just how many games you guys are able to to refer to just sort of off the top of your heads. So, I mean it's a, it's incredible. Um, and what about a favorite? Do you have a favorite game of all time in the the non Hari Krishna category? Just generally, um, many many games are there. It's uh, it's hard to rem- uh, na- name one, but uh, I have seen many games uh, that way, uh, and uh, e- each of them have different patterns. So I ca- I don't want to name just one. And and what about a favorite player? Uh, I like uh, Bobby Fischer. Okay, yeah. Um, and a, a classic for sure. Okay, Hari, the last thing I wanted to talk about is just uh, uh, what what your life is like. I mean, so you're you're recently married. You moved to Prague. Uh, what else do you What else do you do when you're not doing chess related things? Uh, sometimes I play table tennis or badminton, or sometimes go for jog and uh, visit places uh, when I'm not uh, studying chess or uh, play. I mean, okay, I don't. I I played just one match, but I don't play uh, any events in Prague. Um, but I I generally the nature is quite good here. So whenever I get it, I get time. Uh, I I try to you know jog or walk a little bit. And um, yeah, I mean I'm also traveling a lot, so it's good to be home. Yeah, when you're home, how much time do you? typically spend on chess how, like how many hours a week do you think you're you're watching tournaments and studying and stuff like that um like um i i i mean i i um there is uh, okay i can give you uh, on average because uh, it sometimes i don't work that much sometimes uh, maybe a little more um but on average maybe 6 to 7 hours per day at, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a, a good but sustainable pace, I would I would say. Yeah, okay. I I don't I mean, I'm not counting uh, when I'm just following live games or something. Yeah, because, I wondered about that. Yeah, I don't I don't count that as work. Yeah. Okay. So you're working pretty hard then if you're actually working on your openings and doing studies for 6 to 7 hours when you're, you know, when you're fired I, up. I think it's uh, pretty normal, you know, like when you have regular job, you also do the same, same yeah. amount of time. So it's pretty much normal. Just uh, it's n- uncommon for a chess player to say six hours uh, of work in chess. Yeah. OK, well, Hari, I think that, that we've covered everything I wanted to cover. Is there anything else you, you would like to mention before I, I let you go? Um, yeah, um, so thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to, uh, you know, to be on your podcast. This is my first time also, <laughs> uh, just like Chessable. So I am, uh, I am, uh, I, I didn't know how, how it was going to be, but uh, it was pretty nice uh, talking to you. And, uh, you know, it kind of, uh, uh, due to your questions, I could remember my nice moments from '96 uh, and my world, many victories. So I feel pretty good talking to you. Oh, good. And uh, and thanks. Uh, uh, and uh, I hope uh, I hope to do more courses for Chessable. And 
i hope uh, your listeners will uh, look into chessable course of mine and uh, hope they will like it if uh, they are playing french defense uh, from white side yeah from the white or even for if you just want to brush up and see what you might encounter for black because of course when a, when something like this comes out uh, at, yeah. the, at the club level, it impacts the probability that you're going to see it. So, uh, so even people. I, I, I sorry to interrupt. You. I even had a kind of uh, uh, you know uh, master class and uh, some of the students who were uh, up in the leaderboard, which you can see. Right. Uh, I, I it was like kind of my idea to you know motivate the students to study more. And uh, it, it was uh, nice uh, interacting with uh, uh, the, uh, the st- students who were uh, on the top of the leaderboard and to understand how it, uh, how, uh, understand how it uh, is useful or it's difficult or, you know, various things. So I really enjoyed the process and uh, I was uh, happy to uh, share my uh, knowledge with uh, um, most of the guys who play Knight C3 French. That's great. That's great to hear. And Hari, if people want to root, root for you and keep up with you, is there a preferred social media method or way to to follow you? Yeah, I'm on Twitter and uh, Instagram. Uh, not so active on uh, Instagram, uh, but on Twitter, uh, I'm there. You can uh, follow me. Uh, it's Hari Chess. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, I'll I'll link to that in the description again. And Hari, thanks again. You you and David Navarra, you guys from Prague, are just just so nice and so generous with your time. So just just want to thank you and and wish you continued success. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Of course, that includes my producer, Matthew Passy, and Geert Vandervelt. Thanks for supplying the theme music, gear. I also want to thank everyone who helps spread the word about the show, whether it be by writing a positive review on Apple Podcasts or another platform, by telling a friend, by stopping a stranger on the street, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Praising Perpetual Chess on all those things is helpful as well. But of course, most of all, I want to thank the people who help support the show financially. Without you guys, Perpetual Chess would not be possible. I want to give extra special thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable.com, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Apprentice Twitch Channel, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Handelman, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, Dan O'Hanlon, I am Dimitri Schneider, Faraz Sawaf, Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, Jens Green, John Jernigan, John Cromarty, Kelly Palmer, Lone Pine Chess, the Law Offices of Stuart Katz, the Seattle Chess Club, Sidney Andrews, Thomas Tachenko, and Todd Bryant. I also would like to give thanks to my Patreon and PayPal Perpetual Partners. They include, here comes the list, Andrew Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Terakov, Benjamin Handelman, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brett Zeldo, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Chris Balcom, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Chabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, David Kofer, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsburg, Dan Lucas of uschess.org, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Cramley of chessable.com, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, I am Alec Donnie Ariel, Fox Valley Chess Club of Aurora, Illinois, Frank Tortoris, MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barto, Giovanni Russo, Greg Natal, Han Schutt, Harish Srinivasan, James Banastia, Jason Willem, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, JJ Stranod, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, Kare Christensen, WGM Katerina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gapala Krishnan, Laura Belyavsky, Lucio Casada Silva, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passi, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Miguel Araspide, my main man Moonmaster9000, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passi Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Robert Steiner, Ryan Berg, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Steiner Lima, WGM Tati of Abrahamian, 
Thomas Stanix, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrancouz, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and last but not least, Zhivko Storyanov. Thanks, everyone, and I will catch you all next week. Yeah.